The Great Sphinx is among the Earth's greatest cultural mysteries. In the 1930s, self-styled prophet Edgar Cayce predicted that the secrets of the Sphinx would be revealed sometime in the 1990s. And Cayce, it turns out, may have been right. 10,500 BC, this is when the Sphinx is gazing directly at his own image, the constellation of Leo. And if we are to turn 90 degrees and face due south, we would see the three stars of Orion's belt in a pattern that mimics exactly the pattern of the pyramid on the ground. So we have here a perfect conjunction taking place only and only in 10,500 BC. But history books teach us that in 10,500 BC, our human ancestors were still in a primitive state, incapable of the advanced astronomical and engineering skills necessary to build great monuments. We're suggesting that the entire foundation on which our notion of human history rests is faulty. Ancient Egypt, the land of secrets, the land of kings. There are certain things in life that outweigh all others, burning questions regarding the most important aspects of all of us. To fully understand ourselves, I believe it is imperative that we strive to understand where we came from. This quest for the truth, is the driving force behind mystery history. The answers to this question, where did we come from, I feel is more valuable than sovereignty, more valuable than wealth and power. Something that should not be concealed for any reason. Egypt is an amazing place, which opens its doors to many of its valuable treasures. However, the most amazing finds, the most amazing objects I have discovered, remain hidden. Hidden in vaults that may still be flooded with the sea waters that swallowed ancient Egypt. Rooms with treasures that if as old as the erosion of their protective sphinx, may be over 12,000 years of age, artifacts which possess great power, the power to rewrite human history. I'm Mark Lehner and I'm here at the Great Sphinx of Giza on behalf of Dr. Zahi Hawass, helping him out um, on drilling that we're doing underneath the Sphinx. In, in, in our first uh, hole here will be underneath the uh, Sphinx's uh, left paw. Perhaps the most visible example of an advanced civilization in Egyptian prehistory is that the Great Sphinx itself. Although the head was quite obviously recarved in dynastic times, the body and the man-made courtyard in which it sits show signs of heavy water weathering. We think that all the indications suggest that a time capsule was deliberately concealed at Giza in Egypt with the intention that it should be found one day, a time capsule that would abolish all ambiguity over this matter and make it absolutely certain of what had gone before and of what we have forgotten. But a time capsule that was not intended to be found by barbarians, that was hidden away very carefully to be found, as the ancient texts say, by the fully worthy. Perhaps that's who we are. Perhaps that time has come. Perhaps that's the decision and the awe-inspiring prospect that we confront in the near future. The right to open the chamber under the paws of the Sphinx is something of a political game these days. And the Egyptian government is holding all the cards. Only they know when and if the secrets of the Sphinx will be revealed to the world. Expeditions between 1991 and 1993, led by the independent Egyptologist John Anthony West, with Chief Geologist Dr. Robert Schock, Professor of Geology at Boston University, and Chief Seismologist Thomas Dobecki from a highly respected Houston consulting firm, conducted geological and seismic surveys around the Great Sphinx of Egypt. They concluded as follows, the pattern of erosion on the Sphinx indicates that it was carved at the end of the last ice age, when heavy rains fell in the eastern Sahara, more than 12,000 years ago. This contrasts starkly with the orthodox Egyptological dating for the Sphinx of around 4,500 years. The seismic survey indicated the existence of several unexplored tunnels and cavities in the bedrock beneath the Sphinx, including a large rectangular chamber at a depth of some 25 feet beneath the monument's front paws. In 1993, John West and his team were physically expelled from the site by Dr. Zahir Hawais, the Egyptian government's chief inspector of antiquities for the pyramids and Sphinx. 
He was angered by the suggestion that the Sphinx may be far older than the civilization of Egypt itself. A film created from the data linked the Sphinx to the lost city of Atlantis and suggested that the chamber beneath the pause might contain the legendary Hall of Records of Atlantis. American psychic, Edgar Cayce, who died in 1947, prophesied this exact event occurring in the 90s. If his predictions were accurate, then whatever was discovered has been covered up. The Hall of Records is said to be an ancient library, rumored to have been deposited at the time of King Inhotep, in Giza, Egypt. Though, no one knows where. One suggestion has been that it was secreted away under the Great Sphinx of Giza, with a secret entrance to this layer, located near the Sphinx's paws. Dozens of academic researchers and historical commentators have come to similar conclusions, such as Manethu and Plutarch, it houses the knowledge of the pre-dynastic founders and latter Egyptians on papyrus, and allegedly several inscribed golden metal plate scrolls with the partial history of the lost civilization of Atlantis, much as the great library of Alexandria housed Grecian knowledge. The entirety of the ancient Egyptians' knowledge, the builders of the Great Sphinx, the pyramids etc., is said to be held within this place. You have to wonder, what could be contained within these documents that would lead to a huge concealment of this wonder. Does it prove our origins are extraterrestrial? Does it tell of us terraforming the Earth, while our home planet, died? Do these ancient passages contain a vimina? Or an alien craft? Does the library tell of us being visited? Without the world having access to these elusive tunnels beneath the Great Sphinx, all we can do for now is wonder. Over the past few years, we have touched upon many of the amazing and often extremely ancient sites which dot our Earth. Many of these spectacular achievements, indicating to the countless specialists, archaeologists, geologists, and others involved, attempting unraveling of their true history, their true story of antiquity. On several occasions, we have been confronted with compelling and often conclusive explorative analysis which has often resulted in the retrieval of compelling supportive artifacts which have supported the claim of them surviving past cataclysm, often accompanied by an ice age. Our sharing of this data has regularly received a mixed reception. The Sphinx, for example, which shows clear evidence of surviving this past event and subsequent ice age, which involved a flood event. We saw that many were interested in this premise, yet not convinced of such claims. However, a gentleman known as Mario Bildreps has taken this theory and, if confirmed to be correct in his preliminary findings, may have established it as a fact beyond all possible doubt. A link to his website will, of course, be in the description. Mario, it seems, has been very busy. He has correlated the orientation of over 500 ancient pyramids and temples randomly spread around the world to what he claims is a 99% accuracy to the temperature changes during the last glaciation cycles. Most ancient structures, therefore, he has concluded, are hundreds of thousands of years old, and not just a few thousand. Many of the pyramids and temples have been renovated over the millennia, new structures forming on top of older foundations, while the orientation of these foundations remain unchanged. Chichen Itza and Baalbek are two good examples of this practice. He states that the proof is mathematically backed up from start to finish. He adds, the orientation of a building is purely mathematical, because orientation is dimensionless or not materialistic. When we process the orientations of virtually all ancient buildings around the world, it reveals a profound discovery. He claims his research is so new, so innovating, that you won't find anything like this anywhere else, except maybe some copies of this original material on other websites. About 57% of the 501 randomly spread ancient structures that were involved in this research accumulate massively in five clusters of together just 20 degrees or 22.2% along the intersection line. This line is also a purely mathematical entity that runs from our current North Pole to our current South Pole, along a longitude of 47.1 degrees west. It appears a big chunk of his research has been directed towards developing a cardinal reference line, an imaginary line drawn upon the globe, which could be used to match ancient structures to a past location of the cardinal points. 
Of course, if his mathematics can be peer-reviewed and ultimately found to be correct, he could truly be on to something. His research will not only push back the theories involving the chronological development of man, but also prove beyond doubt pre-Columbian voyage up to a half a million years ago, among many other startling realities. The collective orientation of contemporary buildings points almost exactly at our current geographic pole. You might say that the collective unconscious orients itself to the geographical pole, or as many people would say, to the sun. The more data you gather, whether it's in a region, one country, one continent, or the whole world, the more obvious it becomes that contemporary buildings add up to the geographic pole. There is no contemporary culture defined that has a preference for a specific orientation other than a cardinal orientation. It is undoubtedly interesting research, which we implore you to peruse further. We will keep you posted on future developments regarding Mario's work. The severe undulating erosion upon the walls of the Sphinx enclosure undoubtedly show that the Sphinx had been heavily weathered long before the Sahara became a desert. Therefore, one must suspect that it could indeed be over 9,000 years old. Not knowing exactly how much rainfall there's been in the distant past, the Sphinx could indeed be far older than this. The most notable scholarly advocates, Robert Scotch, argues that the Sphinx may be far older than 12,000 years. Robert Baval and Graham Hancock proposed that the Sphinx may have been built around 10,500 BC, during the last age of Leo. Anthony West believes everything on the Giza Plateau testifies to an advanced, secure, and long-settled civilization. Therefore, he suggests that the Sphinx may have been built not during the age of Leo, but a whole processional cycle earlier, in around 36,000 BC a date he feels is more in keeping with the history of Egypt as chronicled by certain Egypt kings. Regardless of an exact date, all of these talented Egyptologists propose a date set much further back within history than currently accepted, and they have provided considerable evidence to back up such conclusions. At the time of disclosure, the argument sent shockwaves through the Egyptologist establishment, not because of the datings, Egyptologists and mainstream historians have grown quite inept at ignoring data, but more because it was realized that there is, indeed, no other explanation for their arguments. There is little doubt that the Sphinx enclosure was subject to severe erosion within its lifetime, and although it could have been explained away as a naturally formed enclosure, we fortunately know from analysis that the limestone blocks dug out from there were then used within the building of nearby Sphinx Temple. Interestingly, no other site in Egypt shows the same type or degree of erosion. Was the evidence hidden away, concealed from the public in what could only be called a conspiracy? Sediments surrounding the base of the monuments and a once existing watermark upon the stones halfway up the Great Pyramid sides indicate just that. Two-inch thick salt incrustations once found within inner chambers Silt sediments rising to 14 feet around the bases of the pyramids found to contain seashells and fossils that have been radiocarbon dated at nearly 12,000 years old have indeed slowly vanished over the years. These sediments could only have been deposited in such great quantities by major sea flooding. A watermark was also once clearly visible on the limestone casing stones of the Great Pyramid. These stones were unfortunately unknowingly removed by invading Arabs. These watermarks were halfway up the sides of the pyramid, or about 400 feet above the present level of the Nile River, 200 feet above the base. It seems the last remaining shred of evidence, the enclosure, survived due to the talented individuals that were required to spot it. Individuals who are thankfully on our side. No other ruins anywhere on our planet is surrounded with more controversy than that of the Great Pyramids of Egypt, or indeed its accompanying plateau. There are many factors to consider when it comes to Egyptology. Within academic fields, there are many no-go areas of study. Although hard work and research within permitted areas has taught us a great deal about the previous 4,000 years of the site's inhabitants. Yet regardless of the most astute academic thesis, there remains three proverbially large elephants in the room. 
When it comes to a full or even a mere fraction of an explanation in regards to the origin of these seemingly impossibly huge pyramids remains patiently absent. No accounts, illustrations of any kind from the era exists. It is simply illogical, especially when one considers the sheer feat these structures must have been. We have presented many previous features, polygonal masonry being present on the pyramids. Eroded, yet younger casing stones protecting inner megaliths, clearly of a tremendous age. Salt sediment found encrusting the lower chambers, and so on, suggesting not only that the pyramids are much older than currently claimed, but were pre-flood ruins. Thus, questions arise. Just how old are the Great Pyramids? In addition to our study of the pyramids, we have also, in the past, asserted that the Sphinx was originally a lion which, interestingly, correlates to the following hypothesis with fascinating accuracy. The Orion Theory The coincidence with pyramids aligned with Orion's belt and other significant constellational positions. Bavall and Hancock support the theory, believing the Great Sphinx was begun in 10,500 BC, creating reference to the constellation of Leo and the orientation of the entire complex with the Nile River and even Milky Way, claimed by them as connected respectively. Zeptepi, using similar methodology, put the age at over 13,000 years. These are clearly astonishing proposals, but the current paradigm for their chronology, we feel, is far too short a time span, and due to our own research, which has uncovered evidence indicative of pre-flood origins, copper tools for such an accomplishment a mere insult to intelligence. Yet, thankfully, due to these various takes on events, their age remains highly contested, and, to us, a mystery which is incredibly compelling. There are many theories attempting to explain the origins of the Great Sphinx and indeed its original purpose. We have, in the past, covered the compelling theories regarding an ancient celestial alignment to the Great Sphinx. Most popular among these alternative theories concerning the star constellation Leo. However, this theory is not only based upon events which happened over two precessions ago but is also reliant upon the Great Sphinx actually once being that of an enormous lion. And although lions are mentioned in countless religious texts, ancient and also modern, with these beasts attributed to good deeds or evil, there actually exists another, and we feel more compelling theory regarding the Sphinx's true identity, purpose, and indeed its age. Since its rediscovery among the sands of Egypt, the Sphinx has been attributed to that of a guardian, long said to have protected the dead, and interestingly, this explanation may turn out to have been spot on. The Sphinx, although now possessing a human head, its form is noticeably out of proportion. If one indeed perceives it as a past guardian of the dead, and the underworld in which they dwell, then the Sphinx would have been in fact a dog, or more specifically, Anubis. Additionally, if the Sphinx did once indeed face a star in our night skies, then logically, there would only be one of two stars in which the dog would face, both held in high regard for untold millennia, one of which of course being Sirius, the other known as the little dog star Procyon. Interestingly, the star Sirius is held in high regard by many ancient cultures, some which insist that we were once visited by gods, locating from this particular star constellation. And with ancient Egyptian art drenched in mysterious beings, all attributed as gods who came from the heavens, it could be postulated that the Sphinx was guarding the entrance to what they perceived as the underworld or the realm in which the gods came from. What supports this theory and the possible concealment of this knowledge? is the apparent destruction, and now absence, of any identifiable dog-like sphinxes left anywhere on Earth. Anthony West once brought the water controversy theory into the public domain, a theory he has done extremely well from. This evidence has long been used as a form of evidence that the sphinx is much older than currently claimed, 
and due to the absence of this erosion on the Great Pyramids, also used it to claim it is much older. Additionally, he has also been a verbal advocate for the belief that the Sphinx was a lion. Worrying, however, regarding his motives, if this were indeed the case, then any compelling connections with the function of the Sphinx, the entrance beneath, and the pyramids, each made to specific sizes in relation to the distance of Orion's stars, would be merely impossible to make. However, and what is most concerning, is that with a little research of ancient texts, it soon becomes apparent that the Sphinx was once surrounded by a body of water, conveniently named the Lake of the Jackal, or Anubis Lake. This aptly named body of water has seemingly been covered up, not only by West, but to attempt to conceal the Sphinx's real age, but also its true identity. This fragment of information not only discredits West's profitable rainfall theory, but also virtually confirms the Sphinx's past identity, and with Anubis being named elsewhere as the guardian of the underworld, it becomes apparent that we are on the brink of an explanation for its original purpose, no matter how astonishing.